today's message, today's message would be, or I would give it this title, The Pressures of the Present Day. The Pressures of the Present Day. In this message, I hope to give us a clear picture of where we are at or to give us some sort of understanding of where we are at in the timeline of God concerning, if you want to say, the end times and the present day. I also want us to look at how to live and fulfill the purposes of God. We'll look at that more at the end in the midst of the pressures that confront us. How many know that we're living in a different time and a day than even what was five years ago? How many know it feels a lot different? And you know, you can point to different times when Christians believed that the end of the day or the end of the age was approaching and Jesus was returning. I know I've heard it many times said, well, everybody's thought that sometime in their generation. Even if you look back into Scripture, you will see that this was something believed even by the early Christian church. The apostles and early Christians believed that Jesus would return in their lifetime. One of the recent activities or events of the world that caused a lot of Christians, I'm talking to my grandparents who are now all past and so forth, but, you know, World War II and, and the activities of that and Hitler and everything that came along with that, many thought that that was the time when Christ was going to return. There is a significant difference, though, in our day and age. The significant difference in this present day is that Israel has been restored as a nation to her own land. And you can look out and you can see what is happening over in Israel today. And you can see what is taking place in our world in regards to that, all the protesting and all the things that are happening. You can look into Bible prophecy and everything that we see in regards to what is to take place in Israel, and you can see that the stage is being set for the return of Christ in the end of times. How many see it? How many think, like, it's going fast? So I want to kind of delve into this today a little bit, but I want to start, first of all, by looking at the foundation for our lives as Christians and give you just some thoughts regarding that before we jump in too deeply. And that's where we get to our first verse, which is Psalm 119, verse 105, which says, and it's a common scripture, something that many of us have even memorized, it says there, your word is a lamp to what? my feet, and a light to my path. I want us to understand today that I can never overemphasize the importance of God's Word to us and for us. I can never overemphasize that God's Word needs to be the foundation of our lives. Notice this verse begins with what? Two words. Your word, referring to God's word. Remember this, it is God's word that provides guidance. It is God's word that provides direction to us. It is God's word that is the standard or the measuring stick for our life and for us living. God's word is the standard for the church. How many know that? God's word is what is needed to be preached from the pulpits of our church. Too many, and I would say too many churches, and I know I've said this before, but too many churches and too many preachers are going by opinion and feeling and have left out and left off God's word. God's word sheds light on the path of life. It helps us see where we are going. God's Word helps us to avoid stumbling in the darkness. God's Word helps us discern right from wrong. 
and truth from falsehood. Again, many have left sound doctrine today. Many churches have left sound doctrine today. Many preachers have left sound doctrine today. They have left sound doctrine for teachers and preachers and individuals who satisfy their fleshly desires and itching ears. They want God's Word to align with their lifestyles. They want God's Word to align with their emotions. They want God's Word to align with their feelings and opinions. They want God's Word to align with what they're doing. Listen to me this morning. Your life must align to God's Word. Your life must align to His measuring stick. Regardless of what you feel, regardless of the emotions that you have, regardless of the opinions that you have, regardless of the questions that you have, regardless what our society says, if our lives do not line up with the measuring stick of God's Word, we are in the wrong. Not God's Word. God's Word is not archaic. God's Word is not outdated. God's Word, as we will see today, is right dead center in the present of our lives and should be present in our lives each and every day. We need the guidance of God's Word continually in our lives. Secondly, another foundational aspect to our lives comes from John chapter 12, verse 46, where Jesus said, I have come as a light into the world. What? That whoever believes in me should not remain in darkness. Speaking to the fact of the significance of Jesus as the light of the world. Jesus is light. He says in John 8 and 12, I am what? The light of the world. And Jesus shines bright in a world darkened by sin and ignorance. He is the light and truth that brings people out of spiritual darkness. The only reason that you're here today is because of what we celebrated this morning in that Jesus Christ went to the cross. He was crucified. He was buried. He rose again, and he's ascended on high. And because of what he has done for us, we believing and having faith in him now have been brought out of the kingdom of darkness and now are in the kingdom of light because of Jesus Christ in our lives. The only hope of the world is not our politicians. The only hope of the world is not the government. The only hope of the world is not some person who's going to come in and save the world. The only hope of the world is Jesus Christ. The only hope for our lives is Jesus Christ. Many people are looking out today, trying to figure it all out, looking out today in a hopeless situation, wondering what's going to come tomorrow, what's going to happen next year. I'm telling you something. You can have hope today about tomorrow. You can have hope today about next year. You can have hope today for 50 years. I don't know when Jesus is. He could come back 50, 100 whatever it might be, you can have hope for every day of your life, every point of existence in your life because of Jesus Christ. Our only place of security, our only way to salvation, our only way to eternal life comes through faith in Jesus Christ. It's not in man's opinion. It's not in some ideas that people have. But it is found in Jesus Christ. And I lay those two things out before you this morning. The importance of God's Word. The significance of Jesus Christ. Because I want us to understand this this morning. That we are in a time of shaking. We are in a time of end time pressures. And it is only through us standing solidly on God's Word and only standing solidly in faith in Jesus Christ that we're going to be able to stand firmly in this day and age. You see, there are pressures today. One is God's going to do it. 
Bible says that God will shake everything. Haggai chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, and you can write these down because I know that's a, that's a little one to find. It says there in chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, For thus says the Lord of hosts once more, In a little while I will shake the heaven and the earth and the sea and dry land. I will shake all the nations, and they will come with the wealth of all nations, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. We have here a prophetic message or a prophetic passage from the Old Testament that is significant about the future and God's divine intervention in the world. It is it is one of the passages that's quoted in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 26 where, where the writer of Hebrew quotes this passage and says this, At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has given us a promise saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also heaven. And this statement, yet once more, signifies the removal of those things that can be shaken, things that are created so that only things that cannot be shaken will remain. My point this morning about this is this. There is a shaking that is coming. And I would say to you, it's here. The Bible says also in this passage that all things that can be shaken will be shaken. Heaven, earth, sea, land, nations. I would also include in there, if you want to expand on it, religion, church, economics, government. All of these things will be shaken. So I would say to you this morning, do not be surprised by what you see in here. Yes, you may be surprised because you are not necessarily expecting those things, but in the end, when your heart looks at it, when you look at it through your spiritual eyes or you look at it through the Word of God, do not be surprised by the things that you see in here. God says, whatever can be shaken will be shaken. I would also say to you this morning, don't be fearful in it. We'll get a little bit more into that. But we don't have to be fearful by the shaking that's going on. We don't have to walk in fear of it. Here's another thought. God promises to shake all things again for removal. You know why God's shaking them? To test them. And to remove or take away the things that can't stand or that can't stand in the test. And by the way, the only thing that will not be shaken is the kingdom of God. The only thing that will not be shaken is His Word. The only thing that will not be shaken is Jesus. The only thing that will not be shaken are those who are in His kingdom. I'd also say this, don't be surprised that there will be those who we think are in the kingdom of God, but will be exposed during this time of shaking. For the foundation that is upon their or in their lives. Listen, COVID started it. COVID was a big wake-up call to the church. Huge wake-up call to the church. We were not ready for it. The church did not know how to respond when the government said, close your doors. And much of the church submitted. I hope we, we as a church, I'm talking not just Cornerstone, I'm hoping we as a church understand there's cost to serving God. A lot of the social issues today that we're seeing 
You might look at it, and I know it's a, there's an evil agenda behind it, but let me tell you something. It's also exposing the foundation of many people's lives. It's exposing the foundation of many churches. You have churches, big churches, big pastors, big preachers coming out and siding and saying, I'm not quite sure this is what Scripture means. I'm not quite sure that this is really a sin. I'm not quite sure that we can judge people. We can judge. We're supposed to judge in a proper manner, but we are to judge. All that can be shaken will be shaken today. And understand that it's God's doing. There's another side to that is that we live in the evil of the last day. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 and 2 says this, Now the Spirit clearly says that in the last days some will depart from the faith and pay attention to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their consciences seared with a hot iron. I want us to understand today that we are living in a time also where we need to recognize the influence of deceptive spirits Deceptive doctrines, seducing spirits, hypocrisy in this time and day and age. That is why I would say to you, be very careful who you listen to on the internet. Be very careful who you read on, uh, read books from. Be very careful what pastor you're listening to. Make sure you look into the background and understand what they believe, what they stand for, what they say. Just because they have a huge internet following, just because they have a huge mega church, just because they have a huge influence in the world. And by the way, I'm not saying that all of them, some of them who have a big internet presence, some of them have big churches, are wonderful preachers. But I'm saying just because they have those things does not mean that God is behind their ministry. Also it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, Know this, in the last days, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, slanderers, unrestrained, fierce, despisers of those who are good. It's coming. It's here. Traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, turn away from such people. It's describing the moral decline in godliness that will take place in the last days. And if you don't see it today, it's there. If people, want, if people want to say, how do you know the Bible is true? Just look at these things that were written 2,000 years ago that describe the day and age that we're living in. With accuracy. We also have in Scripture the comparison with the end times and the days of Noah and Lot. Luke chapter 17, verses 26 to 28 says, Just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying. In other words, they were... Living their best life, you want to say. 
and were given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. You watch the world today, the world is going on like nothing's ever going to change. The world is going on like nothing's coming. The world is going on like nobody's preparing for tomorrow, that everything's just going to happen and you're just going to live your life through and that there's no expectation of Jesus coming back. That's even in the church in a lot of ways. By the way, I'm not saying quit your jobs. Okay? There's the other side. There's some people who want to quit their jobs, go run into the hills, hide in some mountain cave, and wait for Jesus to come. You might be waiting for a while. Who knows? All right? That's not what I'm saying. But there's a lot of people and a lot of Christians who are just living their life thinking that life's going to continue on like this forever. You look in the times of Noah. You could read Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, and you will see the satanic intervention in the supernatural realm. And, you know, I don't know how that, would, how that worked necessarily back then. I mean, that's talking about the Nephilim and all of those sorts of things. I will just simply say this. We see the satanic intervention in our world today. We see the kingdom of darkness in our world today. We see the demonic influences in our world today. We see people siding and partnering with, if you want to say, the demonic influences in the kingdom of darkness and the satanic uh, agendas of our world today. It's very evident that those things are coming out in our world today. When you start looking at things like abortion and you start looking at things like the fact that you can have abortion today. In Canada, you can have abortion where somebody can give birth to a baby that's alive and they can set that baby aside and wait for that baby to die. This is a baby that has gone through the full term of nine months. This is a baby that the mother has decided in the last moments of their life or the, the beginning moments of their life she doesn't want. And you can set that baby aside and not provide care or concern or health or whatever that baby needs to sustain itself. We call that murder. But it's accepted today. Don't tell me that's not satanic. I mean, we can look in the Bible, we can look back in the days of Israel when they had some of the nations of the world who would sacrifice and give their babies unto the God. We're sacrificing and giving our children to, to Satan today. In the times of Noah, there was a complete corruption of the heart. Genesis 6, 5 says this, The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was continually only evil. You can see that pretty much today. Genesis 6.13 talks about how the earth was filled with violence. You know, I, 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 I watch social media sometimes, and I look on Twitter especially, and they'll you'll see some of the things happening. And you'll see people beating up people, killing people. Right there on social media, you can watch it, you can see it. The violence of our world today, and no, 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 you know, like it takes a heart that is seared with a coldness to beat somebody to death. But people seem to be able to do it today without any thought, with a justification of hate. Do 
You see, in the time of Lot, and I won't read it to you, but Genesis chapter 19, verses 4 to 11, you see the brazen, aggressive, violent, sexual depravity of that people. And by the way, it wasn't just among the old, it was among the young. The Bible says there that when the, the two angels entered into that town and they came to, to, to Lot's house, that the young and old came to the house to have sexual relations with the angels. Not just old, it was young and old. And we see it in our world today. You wonder why, you know, we, 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 you wonder why this sexual revolution that we're seeing the sexualization of our culture is not just impacting the old, but it's impacting the young. Listen, these demonic forces are working. They don't care whether you're, they don't look at, are you 18 years and older? They care about, I just want to destroy life. You don't have to look very far when you consider the moral decay and depravity in Sodom and compare it to what we're going through today. You see all these pressures that are happening in our world today. That's why I labeled this message the pressures of the present day. Now, there's some encouragement that comes out of the story of Noah, especially Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7 says, By faith Noah, being divinely warned about things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, and per prepared an ark to save his family, by which he condemned the world, in which, and by which he became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. Listen, God gives us warning, so we know what's coming. God gives us warnings so that we can purpose in our heart and prepare our heart and live in a place of faith. We might look at the warnings of Scripture and say, oh, this is depressing. No, it should be exciting. And I'll tell you why in a minute. We also see in the general present picture of the present day, and you can read it out of Matthew chapter four, 24, the, the talk of international wars, famines, earthquakes, and pestilences. Listen, you're going to hear more and more and more and more and more about these things. And I'll tell you one reason why. The world is setting up for the Antichrist. And who is the Antichrist going to look? Who is the Antichrist going to be initially portrayed as? He's going to be portrayed as the Savior of the world. And you know what the world is setting up? The world is setting up to a place where the average person is going to be looking out for a superstar to sweep in and save humanity. You wonder why there's so much talk about climate change and all that? It's going to take a global leader to come in and try to save that, to try to repair that. All of the things that are happening in our world today, where nation rise against nation, where famines come in, where epidemics, pandemics come in, where there's earthquakes and all of these things, all of the birth pangs that the Bible talks about. And the Bible says in, in Matthew 24, verse 8, that they are going to increase in frequency and intensity. But all of these things are setting up so somebody can come in and sweep in and say, I have the answer, look to me. Submit to me. Follow me, and I will make your life wonderful and great. I will give you peace. I will give you security. I will give you rest. And the world will follow. Without question, the world will follow. That's why so much of this stuff is on the news. It's to put fear in people. Because with fear, you can control people. You saw it during COVID. Why was it every day? I mean, it was, it was frustrating. 
to me every day on the news. 426 people are now confirmed with COVID today. 75 people died of COVID today. And then tomorrow, the same thing. And tomorrow, the same thing. Why? Because it put fear in the hearts of people. And once they put fear in the hearts of people, they could control the people. Matthew 24 talks about the persecution of the church. Verse 8 talks about us being handed over to secular authorities. Listen, we will face persecution. We're already starting to face it. You're probably already having to, you know, I, I hear about situations where people are like, we don't talk about politics at work. I don't talk about politics with my friends. I don't talk about these things with my friends or people that I'm around. Why? Because you don't know the response you're going to receive. There is going to come a time, though, where you're going to have to, we're going to have to make a stand. They're forcing us to make stands. They're forcing us to make decisions. They're forcing us to declare where we rest in, in a lot of these issues. Matthew 24, verse 10 talks about how there's going to be betrayal and apostasy amongst Christians, even a falling away. Talks about, in, in verse 11, the false prophets and cults and how many false prophets will res, rise and deceive many and a warning against deception. Ma Matthew 24, verse 12 talks about lawlessness. And the moral decline and the loss, loss of love in society. Why is it that our world is intent on dividing people by color, by language, by race, by idea? The world talks about unity. Our political leaders talks about diversity and unity talks about all of these things that we, we would say is a good thing, talking about loving one another, but yet they do things to drive wedges between each of us. What is our response in this time? Let's look at that. First, to look in a place of hope. Luke chapter 21, verse 28, which is a, it's the parallel passage from Matthew chapter 24. Matthew, Luke 21, verse 28 says this, When these things begin to happen, what? Look up. Lift up your heads. For your redemption is drawing near. Here's an encouraging hope. Here is an encouraging place of faith in the midst of these things, in the midst of these pressures, in the midst of these challenges. When they begin to happen, it is a signal to look up and to lift your heads. Listen up. You can walk out of this message this morning and be de very depressed. And I understand that because of all the things that are happening. But the Bible is actually telling us when these things begin to happen, when you begin to happen, be or when they begin to come, be encouraged and look up because your redemption is close. You see, the act of looking up or the act of lifting up your head signifies an attitude of hope and expectation. It's a reminder that despite the challenging and, and, the, and the difficult events, believers should not be discouraged, but should remain uh, or should maintain their hope in the fulfillment of God's promises. What did we celebrate even in communion? That Christ will return. Do this in remembrance of me, remembering that I am coming back. Jesus 
is coming back. And listen, God's plan is unfolding in this day and age. Your redemption is drawing near. And Christ is coming back for us. When, I don't know. There are days, you probably had them, when you're like sitting there thinking, God, like if you come right now, I wouldn't argue with you. Ever had those days? Ever had those moments? Like all the bills come into the house. God, like right now. <laughs> or you see what's going on in the world? It's like, yeah, okay, Lord. Today, fine. Just decide to. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna argue with you. But we need to be encouraged in this day and age. We need to be encouraged because these things are pointing to the fact that Jesus will come again for us. We also need to stand in a place of commitment. Psalm chapter 110 verse 3 says this, your people will follow you in the day of your battle. You could reference this to the time of the end times, but it says that your people will follow you in the day of your battle on the holy mountains at the dawn of morning. The dew of your youth belongs to you. Listen, we must stand committed to God even in the midst of the battles of the Lord. We are not here to fight it today. We are not here to fight people. We are not here to fight government. I'm not saying that we don't declare what's truthful. I'm not saying that we don't stand what's right. But the battle is not ours. The battle is the Lord. But what we are to do is to stand committed to the Lord in the midst of what he is doing in our world. That we follow God regardless of what comes. That we follow God regardless of what it costs. That we follow God regardless of where it leads us. We follow God committed to Him. Even as He walks through this world, even as He operates in this day and age, even as He shakes all things, even as He is the one who is fighting the battles of this day. We follow him. And number three, we identify with God's purposes. We need to walk in a place of encouragement. We need to walk in a place of commitment to him. But we also need to walk in a place of identifying with his purposes. 1 John chapter 2, verse 17, it says that the world and its desires are passing away. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. And my encouragement to us this morning is that we must be aligned with God's will, God's plan, God's purposes. Everything else will pass away. Listen, it is fine to build businesses. It is fine to build a career. It is fine to go to school. It is fine to do all those things that are in our world today that are needed to be done. Those things God calls us to do. But listen, there is also a place where we just need to align ourselves with God's plan, God's purposes, God's will, and set aside those things and realize they are only temporal and will pass away at some point in time. You can't take, to, you can't take your job to the grave. You can't take your money to the grave. You can't take your career to the grave. Every one of us, no matter how we've come into this world, how we've lived in this world, every one of us at some point in time will be buried six feet down in some grave all alone with nothing. And the only thing that will last for eternity is those things we've done in the will of God. Let me point out two main purposes of God. 
there's a lot. So let me point out two things. Jesus spoke this just before he passed, or before he went to the cross. He said in John chapter 17, verses 20 to 23, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who believe in me through their words, that they may be all one, as you, Father, are in, in me and I in you. May they also be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. I gave the, given them the glory which you gave me, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be in perfect unity and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. I would simply say this. One of the purposes of God is to highlight or the importance of unity amongst believers. For the purpose of that the world may know that Jesus has sent or that you, Father, have sent me Jesus. I believe some of the shaking that's happening in our world today is so that the church will be restored to a place of unity. We are so much divided on so many things. But I think unity in the church, unity around his word, unity in Christ, is necessary today. One of the things that the world says at times is, how come the church is so divided? Another one comes out of that passage of Matthew 24, where it says there, after all of these things that are going to happen in our world, in verse 14 it says there, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Which emphasizes, which was, which was an interesting thing that Hugo spoke to us about, emphasizing the message or the mission of spreading the gospel to the ends of the earth. That needs to be our goal and desire, too. There are a lot of people looking out in our world today wondering what's going on. There are a lot of people with questions. Lots of people who say they don't believe in God are looking for answers to what's going on in our world. And we have the answers. We have the hope. We have the encouragement. You don't have to hammer it down. All you got to do is just jump in. Say, this is what I believe. The gospel outreach, the gospel message, it, message is something every Christian is called to. Whether you're young, whether you're old, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're male, whether you're female. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 17 and 18, In the last days it shall be, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Why? For what purpose? So your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see vision. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my men servants and maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. There's an interesting thing happening in the world today, in the church. I've noticed it. There's an interesting ha thing happening in the YouTube today. 
and I believe it's satanic. There's a rise to say that females, that women should not be involved in the preaching and the declaring, declaring the gospel message. And I'll tell you something, that is false. One day I might do a message on those such passages of scripture. But I'll tell you something. The Bible says in the last days, God will pour out his spirit on all flesh, on your sons and your daughters, and they will prophesy. On your young men, your old men, on your men servants, on your maid servants, I will pour out my fire and pour out my spirit. The purpose of God pouring out his spirit upon all of us is so that we can go out and declare the word of the Lord to all people. I'm only going to say this. I believe that it's a demonic message that is coming into the church or trying to infiltrate the church to keep women silent. Because I believe that in this last day and age, God wants to pour out his spirit to bring about a great revival. To preach and declare his word to the world so that the world can come to know him. The Bible says that God desires that none would perish, but all would come to everlasting life. And so I would just simply say to you today that this aggressive gospel outreach that we're called to do, the mission of spreading the gospel, is something every Christian is called to. And let's not worry about whether somebody is young or old. Let's not worry about whether they are men or females. Let's just look to the Spirit of God to be moved and poured out so that people can come to know Jesus. Listen, there's a shaking taking place, but God is working. So my encouragement to you, if I would encourage you with two things, look up and go up. Hugo emphasized it, and I would emphasize it to you as well this morning. Praise.